It's tough talking about how human beings can be so inhumane towards each other. But that's the only way we can learn and hopefully, yet more realistically, very slowly, achieve some elevation in our being, ethics, and morality, to avoid such repetitious behavior in the future. We need to talk about the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. We need to talk about the Guantanamo Bay camp in Cuba. And it's with the same purpose that we need to talk about the much bigger human rights and imprisonment injustice that has yet to see its 15 minutes of Western news cycle fame, even though it's been in operation for almost six decades now, and one that would put Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay to shame, and that is Israel's military court system for the occupied territories. In pre-World War II Western Europe, Jews as minorities within the populations cohabitated with the non-Jewish majorities. A short generation later, these same Jewish people saw themselves the victims of an injustice and brutality, a genocide. Another generation passed, and the tides turned, and Israel, now the fledgling Jewish nation in the Middle East, along with its ideological and military support by the West, became the most powerful player in the region. Over these two generations, from the 1920s to the 1960s, came the transition for the Jews from weakness at the beginning to that of strength at the era's end all reinforced by a Zionist narrative fueled by the same credo, anything and everything for dominance and survival. Never again. The safety and security of Israel's Jewish people was above all else, even at the expense of the human rights of others, and even if necessitated, the dehumanization of others. And it's in this era of history is when those in control in Israel transitioned from victim to offender, when the abused prisoner became the abusive guard. Let me elaborate. So if a prisoner experiences violence or subjugation from a suppressive prison guard, and that same prisoner, if given the authority to wield power within a position of dominance over another human being, then it is highly likely that the prisoner will have a shift in their psyche and commit the same violent offenses that they themselves experienced in the past. This is referred to as the victim-offender overlap. The overlap is a psychological behavioral condition identified within criminological literature that shows the strongest empirical associations between victimization and offending. And so, for Israel and a significant part of its Jewish population, the experience of the genocide during World War II, as terrible as it was, was going to be a major learning contributor to the shift in its morality and behavior for many years to come. In 1967, Following the Six-Day War and its subsequent occupation of many Palestinian territories, and to respond to this shift in dominance, came the establishment of the Israeli military court system and the institutionalization of this alteration of morality. This judicial system was a hybrid between colonial administration and martial law that dealt with how Palestinians engaged in political positions and cultural activity and statements, security violations, nonviolent protests, and also in how Palestinians were allowed to move around within the occupied territories. This was the letter of the law for the Palestinians, and would be the platform that resulted in their significant maltreatment by Israel. As with many global military court systems, some of the typical civilian judicial rights didn't apply. But in Israel's system, military courts took on a whole new meaning. Palestinians incarcerated would not need to be accused of any crime to be detained. They could be held for weeks, months, and years without any knowledge of why they were being detained and if they were being charged at all. The system also introduced the concept of administrative detention, meaning open-ended arrest without trial. Other features of the system were the lack of rights to any representation when the accused was prolongingly detained, without the ability to communicate to the outside world, to neither lawyer nor to family, how could those detainees gain their freedom. So in many cases, they didn't. But the evil of the system is not about the lack of rights to representation or charges being filed in a systematic and clear and conscionable manner. The evil comes in the inhumane behavior of those in control within the system, the Israeli military who commit atrocities towards the detainees and the prisoners, and how Palestinians are moved outside the occupied territories, thereby limiting accessibility to them, and how Palestinians leave these prisons with many months, years, and at times decades gone by of their lives, without reason, and how Palestinians have either untreatable physical or psychological damage done onto them 
that will stay with them for the rest of their lives, and how Palestinians will leave the detention camps with their lives cut short, delivered back to their families and body bags. Or in summation, how the military courts involve a systemic, institutional policy focused on the continual abuse and torture of Palestinian prisoners. Looking at the numbers since 1967, 25% of the total Palestinian population and 42% of the male population have been imprisoned at one point or another within this military judicial system. That's almost 1 million Palestinians. And remember, it's not just males we're talking about. No, this includes senior citizens, women and children, making Israel the only nation in the world with a juvenile military court system. And when they're finally accused and tried, the conviction rate is in excess of 95%, the highest conviction rate in the world. In that same period of time, it would be realistic to say that 1,000 Palestinians per year were held in administrative detention. That would mean a total of up to 60,000 Palestinians since 1967, held without charge and without contact to the outside world, for months or years at a time. In terms of abuse and torture, through interviews and surveys conducted with past prisoners by the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem between 1988 and 1992, was that on average, 98% of detainees were beaten. 92% suffered positional abuse ranging from hours to weeks. 44% by strangulation, 7% by electric shock, and 15% of Palestinian prisoners had to be transferred to hospitals for care due to injuries caused during interrogation. During this period, over 105 torture techniques had been used by the Israeli military. Now apply that to the whole 57 years, and the number of victims would be unfathomable. And when discussing deaths at the camps, the numbers might appear to be small at just over 300 since 1967, a rate of 5.3 prisoners per year. But these are deaths strictly ones due to the denial of health treatment, due to torture or were deliberate killings, and not due to natural causes. Since October 2023 alone, 36 prisoners have been killed. These figures, just relayed, are but the tangible consequences of the inhumane actions of the Israeli military. The intangibles have much more significant and wider impact on the mindset and psyche of the Palestinian population. And these intangibles are the results of a calculated strategy and system of abuse and torture, not only towards the detainees themselves, but towards their families and friends, who suffer greatly and are scarred for life as well. The forcible transfer of detainees, even children, in the middle of the night, without cause or reason. Deliberate medical negligence. Overcrowding of camp facilities resulting in extremely bad hygiene conditions. Arbitrary, restrictive and punitive measures. Prolonged solitary confinement inclusive of minors. Violations of prisoner visitation rights. Threats towards family and the appropriation of property. A system where detainees must pay for the accommodation of their basic human needs. And finally, deceased prisoners must serve their sentence fully prior to the release of the remains to their family. And just to bring this point home about this being a systemic and official stance of the Israeli government, let's listen to the words of the man ultimately responsible for the prisons. <laughs> International institutions are exposed to all this barbarity. Many have known the truth for ages and have raised the red flag repeatedly concerning the misbehavior of Israel, but have largely been ignored. This includes the United Nations, with its many papers issued practically in every decade since 1967. Human Rights Watch and the Red Cross have both reported that Israel have long over crossed the line with regard to abuses of fundamental rights. The consequence? Not much. One effect has been that as of last year, the Red Cross is prohibited from the visitation of any Palestinian detainee or prisoner. Another restrictive measure that pushes the whole operation of the Israeli military court and prison system further into the dark abyss. If you want to find out more about the heartbreaking content of these reports, I've put links to them in the video description. And if we imagine the mindset of Palestinians purely impacted by this military, judicial and prison system, without the collective punishment of bombs and killings, 
without the lack of self-rule and autonomy, without the constant added colonial settlement, and without the lack of enforcement of international law by those in power, this alone can have terrible repercussions in how they perceive Israel as a nation and a people, as an evil antagonist in their story, an archetypal bad guy. The figures speak loud and clear. Beyond the hardships confronting the Palestinian people and their dehumanization is when there is no answer to their cries, no consequences to the crimes committed onto them by a corrupt and unjust justice system. Israel will claim that all this is done in the name of survival and the existence of the state, that again, they are the victims. These notions of responsibility and accountability as an offender don't exist whatsoever for them. They answer to a purpose that for them blinds all to their actions, and that is the principle of never again. And never again implies that the means to an end, be it as inhumane as the beliefs and actions of some of the worst criminals of the 20th century, are completely justifiable. However, on the opposite end are the Palestinian families of whom 70% have had one or more family members sentenced to jail terms in this Israeli military court system as a result of statements or actions against the occupation of their homeland, and in some cases simply because they were Palestinian. Family members who have experienced not only injustice firsthand but abuses that create larger and larger psychological and emotional chasms between the two nations of peoples, Palestinians and Israelis. And maybe that is the intention after all, to use a military judicial system as a vehicle to divide, till there is no possible solution, to create hate and fear to the human core so that not only the possibility of a single nation vanishes, but even the aspiration of achieving a two-state solution of neighbors who could cohabitate will become totally inconceivable.